Shalom, Salam, and Shlama, everyone. I hope everybody is doing well. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Mona Kay Show. I am your host, Mona Kay Oshana. I hope everyone's doing well because we are enjoying the greatest weather that we like to boast about in Phoenix, Arizona. We're living in the greatest times in Arizona. If you'd like to visit us, come on down. This is the greatest time because the sun is not uh, as warm, obviously. We're able to enjoy the outside, but of course, with the exception of a little mosquitoes here and there, but otherwise we have glorious weather. I hope, again, everyone is doing well and thank you for joining us once again. If you're joining us for the first time, thank you very much for um, tuning in and I hope you come back soon. And you come back every week on Tuesdays at 8 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. And for those of you that have followed us and continue to um, follow us throughout our program for many, many years when we started in radio and now, of course, having this online program, thank you for your commitment. Thank you for always being with us. As we've been announcing uh, in the last few weeks, we've had a very eventful uh, last few days. Uh, and we've been telling you about the visit of our patriarch, the newly installed and consecrated uh, patriarch of the Assyrian Church of the East, Mar Awa III, royal. Uh, he is the patriarch of the Holy Apostolic Catholic Assyrian Church of the East. He was here among us. He uh, got here Tuesday. And of course, since that day, it's been uh, more like a celebration for the church and the Assyrian community. We've been so lucky um, that he is uh, he was among us. And uh, having arrived, of course, on Tuesday, he was greeted by the church clergy and the faithful of the church. So like I said, it was like a celebration. And uh, it ended with uh, a uh, congratulatory dinner that was held on Sunday that we enjoyed. And we were carrying these, uh, these flags, um, you know, all throughout the, uh, the, um, the dinner party and, of course, everything else that was going on. And uh, we are so happy that uh, he was, again, um, you know, I wanna show off my flag. I wanna make sure I get it on camera. Uh, there it is. Um, we were waving these flags, of course, and uh, his holiness arrived, as you can see from the pictures. Thank you, Fred, of course, this program is coming to you always from the production of Cinnamon Production, the greatest engineer to me on the planet, Fred Duman. Thank you for these pictures. As you can see, that is His Holiness. And as you can see from the attire that His Holiness is wearing, he is truly um, more like a, a king because um, our patriarchs have acted as heads of state as well as heads of our churches because Assyrians being um, a stateless nation from, from the time that they actually converted to Christianity, it has held on to the church and the church has been able, um, it's been the only entity that has been able to hold our community or our nation together because it is only under the roof of the church and within the uh, uh, hedge of protection of the church that the Assyrians have been able to survive. So our holy patriarch, some people would say, well, what's the big deal? He's an equivalent to, uh, to the Pope, uh, but nevertheless, Pope has a international community with the Assyrians, they went from having an international community to a very small um, number of, of Christians and populations had dwindled as a result of all of the persecution that we have uh, suffered. And so the church has been where we have been able to practice our faith, practice our culture, our customs, our traditions, and of course, uh, many of you know that we speak the Aramaic language, the language of Jesus, but nevertheless, it is in the church that the language has been has been preserved. And I speak it, of course, we teach it to our children. Unfortunately, here in the Western world, in the diaspora, as, uh, as the Assyrians have immigrated uh, as a result of the persecution forced out of their homes and their ancestral homes, we are beginning, and not beginning, but we are seeing a, a vast, problem of, of forgetting, um, not maintaining, uh, learning our language, and of course, melting in the greater 
in the greater communities that we are living within, of course, peacefully abiding by the laws, but we are slowly but surely losing our language. And I hope that this new patriarch being young, full of energy, full of ideas, um, can actually do something and, and, and put together programs that we can once again, even we are living in a diaspora, nevertheless, we are going to be able to maintain our culture, our, our, our heritage. And so I wanted to um, kind of give you a brief, uh, I've set that up because I have a, uh, a returning guest. He's really not a guest, he's family. Um, and as many of you know, we've been talking about the this this very famous book this very beautiful book called the assyrian prophecy and the author uh of the assyrian prophecy is with us again uh he was actually here in in phoenix i had the a pleasure the opportunity and the honor to meet him in person and to be able to uh, spend some time with him and he was able to spend some time uh very 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 packed uh week he got here on, I believe, on Thursday, and it's been run, run, run. Uh, uh, there you are. That's at my home in my garden where Dr. Susek was able to meet with uh, mothers and fathers, uh, couples, uh, just from the community, the Assyrian community. We en ended up having an intimate dinner for him, um, and uh, I hope he enjoyed himself as, well, as much as we enjoyed seeing him. And uh, before I get to Dr. Susek and, uh, and introduce him, bring him on the screen, I do want to um, uh, say we are so honored that uh, we were able um, at the dinner to uh, provide two official congratulatory letters. And you saw me touching my head because I thought my glasses were on my head because I normally put my glasses on my head, but they're right here. So uh, we had, uh, and I do want to uh, take the time to thank Congresswoman Debbie Lesko uh, from, from Arizona, of course, she's in the U.S. Congress, who sent a congratulatory letter that was delivered by Miss Monica Yellen and her husband, Douglas Yellen, and they were able to sit with us. And of course, you'll see their pictures later if uh, uh, we can see it uh, later. But uh, I do have also a letter that I was able to, uh, to deliver from uh, Representative Arizona Representative Walt, Walt Blackman, who said, uh, His Holiness Mar our Royal Catholicus Patriarch of the Assyrian Church of the East. Representative Walter Blackman, member of the Arizona House Representative from District 6 and current candidate for U.S. House of Representative representing Congressional District 1, offer my sincere congratulations and prayerful best wishes to His Holiness Mar Awa, the third royal on his consecration as the 122nd Catholicus Patriarch of the Assyrian Church of the East. As I understand, His Holiness was consecrated and ordained as Patriarch on the 3rd of September 2021 in St. John the Baptist Cathedral in Erbil, Iraq. That's where His Holiness was, was consecrated. Making a historic occasion as Mar Awa III has now become the first Western-born Catholicus Patriarch being installed as head of the Assyrian Church of the East. We pray that God bless you and keep you as you shepherd the Assyrian nation into a new era of prosperity and much success. We have enjoyed working with many fellow Assyrian Americans, learning immensely from their vast culture and great Christian faith. Our office is available for any assistance that you may need. Please feel free to contact us. So we are very proud and thankful of both Congresswoman Debbie Lesko and from uh, uh, Arizona House of Representative member uh, Walt Blackman for sending those congratulatory letters. And having said that, I would like to introduce right now uh, our new family member. Of course, he's always uh, he's always going to become family member. Of course, none other than the author of the Assyrian uh, prophecy, Dr. Ron Susek. Welcome to the program once again, Doctor. I I don't mind telling you, Mona, you are stuck with me. <laughs> I am in love with your people. <laughs> God has sent me to your people, and I have, I cannot tell you how deeply I enjoyed and appreciated the time with and being among the Assyrian people and to get to know you and Mr. Wilson. What a special guy you, well, you've married. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. We feel the same about you. And I just saw Diane before the program. I was so happy to see her. 
and I hope that we get to see Diane, your your precious wife. And I keep saying, you know what? If you want to hear an angelic voice, please uh, look her up. She's on YouTube. She's got one of the most glorious voices I've ever heard. Diane Sisek, um, look her up and uh, hope to see her in person one day as well. That's a must. Yes, yes. Well, Dr. Susek, um, you were here, and uh, I know that uh, you came here for a special purpose, for a specific purpose. Because you have, and I know we, we're not going to have it on the screen, but I think um, we've talked about it enough so that I think people can actually just look you up and, um, and see you online, the AssyrianProject.com. And many of you that uh, know Dr. Susek and his book, and by the way, the box of books that you uh, sent, um, all of the people that I've asked, I've, I've given out except for two. I've, I still need to send out two of those books. Um, you came here for a specific purpose, and let's let's repeat, let's actually go over that so we can set up what we're going to be seeing. We're going to see uh, uh, a short video in the next few minutes, but I want you to tell me, once again, and for those that haven't heard it, what was your purpose of your visit? Well, as I shared with the patriarch, I understand authority. <clears throat> you cannot exercise God's authority one bit more than you're first submitted to it. And God has set up his orders of authority. And uh, when you defy those orders or you try to go against them or override them or end run them, you're not going to succeed. God will not bless that. And so I, I explained to the, the patriarch that I feel so strongly that um, Jesus said, I, with, without his father, he can do nothing. Jesus also said, I don't say what I want to say. I only say what my father is telling me to say. And I don't do what I want to do. I only do what I see my father doing. So if we are to be like Jesus, we better be doing the same thing. And that's why knowing that God has established the patriarch as the head of the Assyrian church worldwide, if I'm to have a ministry to these people, then I must receive his blessing. And as I said to him, I'm not coming in as a hero. I'm coming in as your son and as your servant. And, uh, and I need your blessing. And he graciously granted his blessing to all. We, we spelled out all of our plans, everything that we uh, uh, have in mind to be doing that we feel God is leading us to do. And so his blessing was saying, yes, you are free to minister among our people. So that was a wonderful moment for me. Yes. And we're showing pictures, uh, still pictures of that meeting where you were at my house on Thursday, the 11th, it was 11, 11. And, uh, after having refreshments, we actually, uh, uh, you got on your knees and it shows that uh, you said, I am not getting on my knees before uh, the patriarch, but what um, I'm going to, I'm going to let you complete that sentence. Well, I'm not kneeling to a man. I'm kneeling to God, but God's authority does come through that man. And that's very important. And so uh, for me, we cannot succeed without that. And, uh, <clears throat> and I believe that we have seen so much success since the previous patriarch blessed me. We have seen amazing success. Some of it is so mm -hmm. unimaginable already. Uh, we're not free to talk about certain things yet, but we've seen great success and, and, and pro progress uh, with the Assyrian people and the Assyrian prophecy. And uh, I anticipate that uh, the blessing of this patriarch is going to be another booster rocket into where God is go going, not where I'm going, but where God is going, I my eyes are on Him. Absolutely. And uh, Fred, if we can show that video uh, clip, I know it's, there's no really sound uh, to it, but if we can show that video of uh, His Holiness Mar Awa the Third blessing uh, Dr. Susek right now, if we can. You know, that's the Lord's language. The Lord heard that. 
<laughs> and there you have it. Uh, did you see that, Dr. Susek? I know you oh, haven't yes, seen that video. Yes, a very special moment. That, that's the first time I've seen it. Yes, very special moment. Yeah, and I'll be sending that to you. I know you're going to be using some of that material yes. uh, for your publication. And we want to explain. I, I want to be an example of how to use a, a, what authority is. We need to teach this because we in the West have lost our understanding of authority, even in many of our churches. And we have a, a, a view that um, authority is always bad and oppressive and controlling. And uh, we fought the revolution and we got out from under that and we got out from under that politically, we got out from under that spiritually and that's what's bad. And uh, so it's as we honor our fathers in our homes as we honor those in authority, as Paul tells us, and we pray for them. And, you know, we, we want to say, well, we'll do that if they're just perfect all the time. Well, the Apostle Paul one time was smacked in the face by a high priest. He did not know he was the high priest when he smacked him. And Paul gave him a sharp answer. And they said, this is the high priest. And Paul apologize to a man who is completely out of line but the, at the same time he was honoring the man's position and we need to learn mm -hmm. that in the west we're falling apart because we have lost our understanding of authority amen and i want to take you back also to the old testament when um king david was anointed but nevertheless saul was also anointed even though the spirit of god had left him and when that's David correct. found himself in the camp, in the tent of King Saul. Um, he would not touch him. And he took a piece of his garment and he took it with him. And then later on, of course, he said, I was in you. You know, I could have killed you. He said, how could you say that? And he proved it by showing the garment saying, but I would never touch the anointed of That's God. It. Again, respecting That's authority. Oh, that that <laughs> you you nailed it. You nailed it. And um, uh, if we do not restore that here in the West, we'll collapse. Why? Because God will not honor it. He will, he'll take his hand off of it. So it's critical. And that's why I, I, I came home totally exhausted. I mean, the, my flight home, I hardly remember it. I was so tired and uh, went to bed last night and, and had a long, deep, comfortable sleep. And now I'm just kind of relaxing in my a little studio study, uh, but I have such a sense of freedom and release from the Lord because we honored his system. Exactly. And this is a confirmation. And I want to I want to thank you for going out of your way, for going above and beyond. Um, here you have a mission uh, for the Assyrians. You have a Assyrian project. It is a mission of life that you have actually included into the Great Commission uh, ministry that you uh, preach to the world. You inserted the Assyrians in there. And I was dis discussing that with you, how it now fits all in together, because you call the Assyrians the greatest missionaries, the greatest evangelists that um, probably in history. And without that piece of... Uh, how, uh, without that piece of information or that project or that mission, including the Assyrians in there, you really don't have a great commission, a complete great commission. Why? Because the Assyrians took it upon their life to go to China, to go to all of Asia Minor. And, and having 84 million, accomplished 84 million members from all across the world and then dwindling down to where we are today, I know that our numbers don't, you know, uh, do us credit for all the missionary work w that we've done. But I want to thank you for making it a part of your ministry and making it a part of your life. And this blessing that you received from the Holy Catholicus Patriarch is confirmation to the Assyrian community that you are walking within authority, under the authority, uh, under the authority of God, first of all, but with everything else. So I want to thank you for that. Well, it's my honor. And uh, my, my, my passion in all of this, uh, well, I have a lot of a lot of things in my heart and mind about it, but I, the most important thing to me 
is to pray and work towards seeing the will of God in heaven established on earth. That to me is the mm -hmm. final reward. I can't ask for more than that. Uh, th there's nothing in this that I'm seeking for myself other than the joy and the thrill of seeing God's will. And we know what God's will is. He stated it in the prophecy. Mm -hmm. And uh, the whole church worldwide needs to awaken to this and begin to move with us in, in giving the Assyrians a face to be seen, a name to be recognized, and a voice to be heard. Because these people, these wonderful people that God raised up in the early mm -hmm. centuries to, to, to evangelize the world of their day, and they literally became the foundation of the church of today. They're, the, they're yes. our parents, and we don't even know they exist. And, uh, and so God has not only, used, not only used them then, but I believe that they are to be the, uh, one of the mega voices for the gospel. And if you recall, I shared that, that view with the, the patriarch, that this is my drive and my passion to see the church awaken and raise them up. And by the way, let me just let me just say, Mona, you know what? The Assyrians are small. It's a small group compared to China and America and India. But you know what? They have God. And God mm -hmm. always begins with the small to prove his might and his power. Jesus mm -hmm. was not born in the megalopolis of Jerusalem, he was born seven miles away in tiny little Bethlehem. When he came back to Jerusalem on his way to the cross, he was riding a donkey, not a beautiful stallion. He went from the donkey of humility before man to the temple of humility before God. And then he went out and shared with his disciples and then he made his way to the cross. God be begins with one man. He begins with one small group. And, and he does a great work. Listen, Israel is not a mega nation by any means. Never will be, in fact. And God, God, God has chosen a land that is really not that beautiful. I mean, I, it's dramatic where Jerusalem is, very dramatic. But it, there are a lot of cities around the world that are much more beautiful than Jerusalem. But God, because he is there, his glory is there, his might is there, his power is there. And isn't it interesting that Jerusalem is now, even though it's not the most beautiful city in the world, it draws more attention than any other city on earth and even more contention. Now, God is going to unite Jerusalem uh, or Israel, Assyria and Egypt, three nations that have been almost irredeemable enemies for many, many years. They will become one because of the power of the gospel. The gospel not only gets hell out of us and us out of hell, but it also has the power to turn the hate center of earth, the Middle East, into the love center of earth that's going to rule the world under the Messiah by teaching them the ways of God. And Assyria, even though she may be a small nation, right now today she is going to have that extraordinary position because god said so and dr susek um i want to ask you and i know we were discussing this earlier uh where you said that uh it's amazing how some people and i think they responded to you and in, uh, in this in this question or i said this comment that the isaiah 19 prophecy has already come to pass that's what they said to you and what is your what was your response or what is your response to that has the isaiah 19 prophecy come to pass already has it been fulfilled it has been fulfilled but not on but not in this let, let me explain it when jesus said on the cross it is finished all prophecies were fulfilled in him mm -hmm. but they are yet to be played out and because people have a great difficult time believing God for the future, and that's what faith is. Faith is believing where God said he's going, even though we don't see it yet. That's what faith mm -hmm. is. In Hebrews chapter 11, read the first three verses. It's as clear as, as day. And even though Jesus said it is finished, yes, at that point, it was a done deal. He has sealed it. 
it's going to happen. Now, the reason why I know it's still in the future is because never in the history of the world, you cannot point to any point in time when Assyria, Israel, and Egypt were walking a highway of holiness between the three cities, worshiping God together as one and providing a blessing that's impacting the whole world. That has never happened before. Therefore, we know that the prophecy in the tangible sense is yet to be fulfilled. Yes, uh, absolutely. And thank you for that clarification. Um, let me ask you about um, your experience when you were here. I know that uh, I'm obviously when I met you, you had already met many Assyrians. And I know that you met um, Father George Bethrashu from uh, LA and uh, he introduced you to a group of people there from the Assyrian community. And I know you've got friends that um, you've interacted with, but I want to ask you what uh, was your experience and what was the difference and what would you be able to share about the experience that you just went through from Thursday to Sunday? I know we tired you out. I know there were <laughs> multiple events at times. Um, and uh, tell me about your experience overall. How was it? Well, my first baptism into Assyrian food was by Father Bet Rasho's wife. And that was about two and a half years ago. And uh, that meeting was only a one night meeting with leaders. And so from that day to this, because of the coronavirus nailing everything down, uh, I've only been able to work with selected leaders like Sabri, um, uh, Atman, and uh, other leaders, but we've been working more on a one-on-one -on -one basis and largely by telephone and so forth. And so coming to Phoenix uh, gave me a deep dive right into the Assyrian people uh, to share with them and mix with them and hear them. And I have to tell you, that uh, I, I, I came away with a real glow in my heart that these people are easy to love and wonderful to love. I've loved them ever since, but I've loved them vicariously from a distance, having read about them and being called to them. But now to be among them, I, I experienced things that really were, were so affirming and so marvelous. Uh, frankly, I, I, don't, I have never experienced such respect in any circle as I did this past week in Phoenix among the Assyrians. Uh, I'll never forget uh, the Sunday morning that we were in church together and uh, you moved, we, we were in the third row and you moved to the second row, I assume to be able to get better pictures of the patriarch. And two men in that row, uh, I don't know if they knew who I was or, or how they f discovered that. All I know is that one turned around and offered me his seat in the row where he was and he wanted to move back where I was. And then a second man did that. And then you explained to me later what a beautiful thing that it's in the culture and in the spirituality of the Assyrian people <clears throat> that you never have a person of honor, you never have your back to a person of honor. That That is unknown to the West. And yet that's such a rich culture, uh, a, such a true spirituality, such an honor. And, um, and I had many experiences like that. In fact, the two men that were just on the screen, uh, they came asking for my autograph on, on a book that they had purchased. And they, they kept saying, they're humbled by this. And I'm thinking, my word, I'm privileged. Please don't say that. But the whole culture seems to understand that. And I think that to come through 2,000 years of mega persecution and to have this spirit of respect and honor, I think is just, well, what does God call it? the work of my hands, the work Amen. of God's hands. And I see, I see shaping of God and the Assyrian people 
that I long to see happen in Christians in the West. Absolutely, and I remember telling you, um, when I moved right in front from where you were sitting, I kept turning around and kept saying, I'm so sorry, I'm so, I felt uh, guilty for sitting before you with my back, uh, but that was, again, and thank you for clarifying that because um, they could not allow everyone to be in the aisles to take pictures. I had to be as close to the altar as I possibly yeah. could to get the pictures that oh, I yes. ended up getting. So, yes, and uh, not knowing what the culture is, that's why I kept apologizing. And, yes, the two men <laughs> next to me uh, saw that, uh, um, obviously, that uh, you were new to the church, and they uh, they felt the need to give their seats up. And of course, you graciously wow. declined and, and remained seated there. But yes, I mean, and having said that, um, having experienced the little things, the little things in the culture, um, as you saw in the church when people were trying to give you uh, their uh, their positions, their, their seats. Um, tell me if with this experience that you experienced this time that you went through walking with regular people, not leaders of the community, just us regular people, what would you have done differently with the Assyrian prophecy? And before uh, you answer that, I do want to show and I do want to announce once again, for those of you that want to get a copy, uh, Mo the Monique Show is providing free copies of the Assyrian prophecy to anyone that uh, messages us with their information, of course, their name, um, their full address, and their email address. I, I really don't need your phone number, just a, a physical address and an email address, if you would, please. So talk to us about what would have been different. I know you would. You said that you would already have written the book. The book is was in, on your heart. You would. would there have been anything different, an approach, a different approach to the book had you had this population, had COVID not uh, obviously stopped you in your tracks? and what you just experienced, would there be anything different? I love that question. <laughs> You've got a penetrating mind. I love that question. <clears throat> Let me just say before I answer that, Mona, I'm pleading with all your friends and viewers, please, please get the book. Please send your name and address to Mona to send to me because I have a fabulous magazine coming out at the end of the year about the Assyrians. I want to send you a copy. So please do this. You've got to help me help you. I'm trying to get your message out to the world. And we are committed to that. And God is opening some wonderful doors. But I'm, I'm pleading with you, get the book. In fact, get more than one. Hand it to friends and neighbors. You've got to help me to enlarge people's vision and understanding of the Assyrian people. Now to your question. Would I have written some things differently in the book? I've thought about that now for quite a few hours since you first posed that. And my answer is the same. I don't think there's a word I would change. And, and there's a reason for that. Um, what I experienced in, in, in Phoenix confirmed what the Spirit of God led me to write back then, when it was all research. But in my research, I was catching the passion of the people, the heart of the people. Who in the world can imagine after your one patriarch, uh, Mar Shamoon, was assassinated brutally with 48 of his bodyguards all massacred? Uh, who can imagine his brother, now the patriarch, standing before this crushed, broken group of Assyrians in, in a refugee camp, and I can see them sitting there in my mind with tattered clothes and broken dreams and shattered lives. And he stands up and says, maybe we haven't suffered enough yet. Mm. That showed me the soul of Assyria, the soul of Assyria. And that showed me the kind of people that God is preparing and shaping to raise up in a mighty position along with uh, uh, Israel and Egypt under the authority of the Messiah, teaching the world the ways of God. And um, 
So as I think back upon writing the book, Mona, I, I'm not boasting in the slightest. I'm just telling the facts. Uh, I have, I, I really poured probably far more time into prayer than in research and writing, really seeking God and asking him, what do you want to say in this book? Now, this book is not the Bible, uh, not, by, not by a long shot, but uh, I really feel that the Spirit of God led the writing of the book. And many times I would come up against a wall and then and then sometimes waking up in the morning, suddenly the next chapter was unfolding to me. And it was a lot of work, a lot of sweating of bullets and late hours and bad headaches and strained eyes and everything else because of what we, I was jumping into 4,000 years of history to study. And uh, But I, I, I really felt the Spirit of God leading that book uh, to be written. And uh, so rather than saying, boy, I should have said this differently or that differently, I'm finding that in meeting the leaders and meeting the common people um, that God, I think, gave me the heart of the people. And now I'm witnessing the confirmation of that. Well, that's great because you were led by the Holy Spirit and you would think that the Holy yeah. Spirit knows, of course, the past, the present and the future. And so I'm so yes. glad that you answered that <laughs> questions in that way because of the fact that when God is leading you, uh, time does not exist. And the knowledge that you gain based on the awareness that you've had, Dr. Susek, ever since you discovered, and I know that it was during the ISIS attack of Mosul, that you said your blood boiled. And you kept saying mm -hmm. that your blood boiled. And of course, you realize the Assyrians, the biblical Assyrians are still uh, alive and of course struggling, not thriving, but struggling. So, um, and, and, and that actually is confirmation that the Holy Spirit is leading you. But yeah. writing the book, and exactly, it is not the Bible, but it is Bible-based, which is wonderful because the Holy Spirit is here to help us to, uh, to open right. our eyes and to give us knowledge. And so we continue, even though, as you said, on the cross, the, uh, the Lord said, Christ Jesus said, it is finished, but the motivation and the empowering of the Holy Spirit continues. And this is nothing more than um, opening up. And, and you know, for the Assyrians, again, it is not the Bible, but it is a word of hope because we've been so demoralized. We have so been beaten. We have been, our persecution, our struggle is so much so that we sometimes, we don't lose faith, but we lose sight of hope. And we stop believing in ourselves. We keep going back to history and taking strength from the mightiness of the Assyrian warriors and of course the faith of the Ninevites and a lot of people go to call it the story of Jonah it's not the story of Jonah it's the story of the faith of the Ninevites who are the Assyrians who are the Assyrians and we are the descendants so your boat book actually people that were approaching you they were approaching you with such hope and such joy and happiness and we're so honored to shake your hands and to say, thank you for writing this book. And these are people that you had met before and were resonating with a message that you hadn't, uh, that were, that were, that's in the book yet. You had not experienced the culture as you did in the last. So again, I, I truly believe that it was the Holy Spirit that led you to write the book and thank you. And for those of you that are out there, um, please, Christmas is coming. Uh, even if you've gotten a copy, get a copy for a friend of yours. Get a copy for not, you know, necessarily an Assyrian friend because it is written in English. And don't forget, it is written in English by a man that um, truly uh, understands the prophecy so well that, you know, I mean, here he is. He's written a book to, uh, to give us hope and to send our message. And we as Assyrians need to partner need to partner with Dr. Susak and because he is sending our message out. I mean, if we were, um, we're not calling him a savior, we're not calling him, obviously, I mean, he's, he's a man just like, you know, he's a human being just like you and I. And so, but at the same time, he's been inspired by the Holy Spirit to write a book. And how many of us have been crying out to say, when are you going to hear, when is the world going to hear us? They've abandoned us. Hmm. Well, here you have a man that has written a book that has, written our message and all we need to do is partner with him the assyrianproject.com is where you need to go 
uh, and, and find out all dot org. I'm sorry. The Assyrian project dot org is exactly where the website you need to go and, you know, yeah. uh, include your information so that you can be included in that newsletter. This newsletter that is phenomenal. And how often does the newsletter uh, public is, is it published, uh, Dr. Zizek? Well, I, I write a letter every month, but uh, magazines are expensive to put out and it's full colors. So it's a, they're beautiful and well done. Um, and uh, we generally put out a magazine like that between two and four times a year. And that is to give our partners a real fresh view of what their help and their prayers are accomplishing. And, uh, and this issue has some very stirring information about the Assyrians. And uh, I, I really hope that people will get this magazine. Uh, we'll, we'll send it to them. All we need is their name and address. And, um, and in so doing, uh, I'm, I'm hoping they may get more than one copy if they request it so that they pass them out. Because again, we need help to get your story told. And we, we feel like we're still at the starting gate. We have a lot of work to do. Uh, in, in my time of prayer, I am asking God to give us, to give us the ear and the heart of the world. And do I think he can do it? If it's his time, yes, he can. And uh, so we, we're just doing all we can at this level. And we, have, we started with zero and we're off, we're off the starting block and we're seeing some amazing things happen. In fact, um, again, there are some developments so incredible. Uh, I'm not comfortable sharing them yet because uh, I want them to become more tangible. But I want to say that um, this book is reaching circles that we could never have imagined of uh, leadership in the world. And there's a stir of interest. And, um, and again, I really believe it is because this is God's time. Remember now that this prophecy has remained hidden to the eyes of the greatest theologians in the world for 2,700 years. That's the only thing I ever hear my theological friends asking is, Ron, why didn't we see this? Well, I didn't see it because I'm a genius. I saw it because God chose to, to open my eyes to it. And it took a couple of decades for God to really get my attention. And then the assault by ISIS is the thing that I, I, I just knew I was, I was burning inside. I knew I cannot stand before God someday and answer to why I did nothing but sit here in my home and watch the, watch the news. When now I knew what Satan was doing. I knew who they were after. And, uh, and everything in me was crying out, God, what can I do? And that's when, the words of the first Amer uh, Assyrian I ever met, Reverend John Bucco, came back to me right the next book. And uh, so that's why I did it. And, uh, and a lot of, lot of hard work, very hard work. But by the grace of God, the book came together. It was released. And now we're watching it unfold step by step. And uh, I, I think that we're going to just watch the momentum pick up more and more again not because of me i you said it well i'm just a man god uh, i have to remind everyone god did not choose me because i've got something to offer god god takes the thing that is nothing to bring to nothing the thing that is he takes the foolish to confound the wise he takes the weak to bring down the mighty a little david to bring down a goliath so there's there's to be no spotlight on me the spotlight is on the glory of god and the timing of god and we appear to be in that time when god is lifting his hand and now people of uh, great significance are beginning to see it and awaken to it so this is a time for assyria to begin to pray as they've never prayed and to begin to believe god and prepare 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 when, when the day comes, when it's time for God to restore them to the land, they can't go back dragging luggage of uh, yeah. divisions and anger and anything else. We've got to become like Christ because we're to be serving under the Messiah. And to serve yeah. under him, we've got to be like him. 
Yes, absolutely. And you know, you're absolutely right. I've often just said God uses broken vessels to glorify and to serve his purpose. And we are all broken vessels, Correct. of course, and uh, in need of salvation. Dr. Um, Susek, you, you had more of an intimate, I know we were planning uh, to have an event for you on Friday, but you did something so humbling. And I, and I have to mention it on the air. I know I mentioned it to the group of people that we ended up having, having, having uh, that I uh, hosted, my husband and I uh, hosted at our home. But we were planning on a bigger event, but you said, you know what, Mona, something heavy on my heart. You called me and said, is it possible? Would you be offended if I asked you not to have that event? And your reasoning for that was that because the patriarch was coming to visit the community here in Arizona, that you did not want to take away from the attention that the patriarch would otherwise have um, and that you wanted a more intimate gathering. And I was just so impressed with that because you felt the need not to do the gathering because where in fact we would have been uh, advertising and we would have probably have had over 200, 300 people, but you didn't want to have that. So we ended up having the intimate dinner at my home. Tell me the reasoning and kind of fill the people up of what was the, the what drove that thought? What was the idea behind that? Well, I, I, I thought it was a great idea to have the big event because this was my first time out of the cage since uh, uh, the virus. And uh, uh, I've been dying to get before the Assyrian people and to encourage them. Uh, and so I was all in favor of it. Uh, and then then I was, just, I was just troubled in my heart for a couple of days and nights. And one night I got up and I said, Lord, if there's something out of order, you've got to show me because I, I mean, I'll, I'll do whatever. And it came to me that, you know, there, there's a scripture that if you go to the head table, then you can be sent back in humiliation. But if you wait until you're invited to the head table, then you have gained the blessing. And it dawned on me, this is his time. Uh, he is now traveling to the various parts of the world in order to meet with his people and to to uh, gain their favor and trust. And I didn't want anything that we were doing to compete with that. Um, and, and so that's what I, uh, why I, I did that. God will raise me up in his time and his way. I don't need to make that happen. And it's when we try to do things for God that we really get into trouble <laughs> and make bad mistakes. And I, I was, I, I have to tell you, Mona, everything in me was, was just the, the thought of calling you after all the work that you had put in. You had already had the auditorium, you had everything lined up. I mean, and to now call and say, and, and to call it off, I, I was, my stomach was churning. And when you're, when you responded the way you did, I, I, I thought I just, I thought if I dove into a, a pool of water. <laughs> it, would, it felt so good to have your agreement. Yeah. And you know, it's wonderful that we are building that kind of a relationship, Dr. Susek, so that um, you can you can always pick up the phone and let me know what you're feeling. And uh, what was my response to you? I mean, I was okay with it, right? I remember your words. You said, I, I honor you more. I respect you more for that decision. I remember those words. And that yeah. meant a lot to me. That was telling me that the Holy Spirit was affirming to your heart what he was troubling me about. And I think in the agreement that that sent a message to the whole hierarchy, we're not down here competing or playing a game or trying to end run. We are truly trying to serve under your authority and leadership. Yes, and that's exactly what we are. And you know, patience is a virtue. And so it didn't happen now, but I think you, and if Fred can show some of those pictures, um, I know you've got some programs. We're not going to get into them right now, but there's a reason for the pictures that we did. Women separated from the men at my house and in, in, in our garden. But um, it was um, truly a blessing to have uh, the intimate uh, dinner that we had. People got to know you. That's uh, Shamasha. Deacon Sam Abraham interviewing you 
And of course you have, there you are in the midst of uh, all of the ladies that were there. And uh, there's the fathers, there's the men, and every one of them got a book. And uh, we truly, uh, and every, and here you are speaking. I think you spoke for about 20, 25 minutes about your message. And they were able, believe it or not, from that small group, and there I am with my husband, Shamasha, or Deacon Wilson, uh, and yourself. Um, the message uh, resonated, and believe it or not, just like what you said in your speech that day, like the 12 disciples who ended up, up revolutionizing the world. I mean, started a revolution all over the world. And that's you next to the sign um, at the banquet hall, entering into uh, the hall. And of course, there you are with the patriarch uh, at the dinner party, which uh, we had a wonderful dinner. We were hungry. We were so hungry because we had been running around. And so we finally ate and, uh, you know, we finally got the uh, picture with His Holiness. But your message resonated and there's you and my husband sitting next to each other, of course, at the event. Um, and um, so I want to thank you. Thank you for your heart, for your compassionate heart. Thank you for listening and opening your ears. And I know I've said this. And there were those two men that actually came and said, we need to shake your hand. And just like those two men in the church that were, uh, were giving you their seats, these two men came up to me and said, did you announce his name? Did they say his name? I said, yes, yes. He was honored. He was recognized as being there. And uh, they were making sure that you received the highest honors because of the fact that you have chosen this, uh, this path to, um, to send the message of an abandoned, forgotten, demoralized, beaten people that God allowed the exodus from the Middle East so that we can breathe finally and we can rest and we can rise up. But I hope, I hope that we haven't forgotten our duty as Assyrians. Um, and this book is actually a reminder, Dr. Susek, because when someone is tired and they want to rest, I think they forget themselves in that rest and say, I'll, get, I'll do it later. I'll do it later. And I think this awakening is more for the Assyrians so that they can rise up and send the message out. And then, of course, uh, help in, uh, in awakening the world to this prophecy and for the second coming of Christ. I'm with you 100%. I can't tell you how uh, since 2014, uh, the Assyrians live in my heart. And, and, and God did that. Um, mm -hmm. We were very involved in uh, large Great Commission summits all over Africa. And um, uh, I thought that would be the thing that I would be doing for the rest of my ministry. And then in 2014, uh, that, as the Bible speaks about, the heavy hand of God came upon me. And yes, we're still doing the Great Commission summits, but I see uh, that I'm not deviating from my calling. Because as I shared with the patriarch, one of the driving factors in me is, uh, is to help the, the, the Assyrians regain that voice that they had in the early centuries in order to work with us for the advancement of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they are a, a tremendous exhibit. When God raises up the Assyrians, which personally I think is going to be fairly soon, mm -hmm. uh, the cats of the world are going to be all over you and your people asking you questions. Who are you? What are you? Where are you? Why is this happening? What's going on? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's not the time to be political. Yeah. That's the time to stand in front of those cameras and explain the gospel of Jesus Christ. That Assyria must not look to its past for its identity, but to its future. And its future is all about the cross and the resurrection and Jesus Christ. Uh, that's the future of the church. Every Christian in the world needs to forget their past, not only the sinful past, but even their cultural past, the deep past. It's over. We, we are a new people preparing for a new kingdom and a new world, and it's coming. Now is when we get ready. Yes, absolutely. 
And uh, I know we've got so much more to talk about, but we're running out of time. Um, I want to thank you, Dr. Susek, once again. And of course, this is going to be a regular uh, program where we're going to try to see, I'm not going to say once a month or every, every few weeks, as the need becomes, of course, apparent, you'll always have a home here at the Mona Kay Show. Mm -hmm. And uh, all we need to do, and of course, we're going to be communicating constantly. And if there's anything, uh, any event that comes up or any development, of course, we'll have you back on. But I do want to thank you in the meantime. We've enjoyed spending time with you, my husband and I, my family, the Assyrian community. And by the way, Sarge is on, uh, uh, on I was just reading his message. He says, Mona, please say hello for me. So Sarge is on. Uh, thank you for tuning in. And I've got, um, he wants to say hi. Uh, so say hi to Sarge. <laughs> Sarge, I salute you. <laughs> he, he's my thank friend. We, Sar, Sarge and I had the fastest dinner recorded in world history because <laughs> uh, he graciously took me out to dinner. And uh, I think we went to an outback. And because, because of the crowd, we had to sit at the bar to eat uh, or we'd have never been able to get in. And uh, uh, all of he suddenly had to rush off in order to uh, be with the patriarch and to take him somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> and so we were looking forward to a relaxing evening of a great conversation. And it turned into be two buddies sitting there gulping our food as fast as we could without getting indigestion and then rushing <laughs> off so he could get back to the patriarch. So Sarge, we got to get together. We will. Yeah, and he's laughing about that too because uh, Sargon Melki was part of the entourage, of course, that was accompanying the patriarch everywhere they went. He is so tired, I'm sure, and uh, along with the, uh, I think it was uh, Stephen Haji, uh, Michael Jabri, um, uh, Johnson Narse, and among the other people, of course, that were there with him, the clergy, the priests. So um, I know he says, yeah, hopefully next time you're going to get to have that relaxing dinner. Uh, and I better be invited if, if you're going to uh, Outback once again, please. <laughs> well, let me just say, Mona, that, that if there's anything that really sharpened in my mind in this trip and meeting with the patriarch and the people around him is I, 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 I knew this, but, you know, knowing something and having it become experiential are two different things. And I came to the deep realization that he is not only the spiritual head of the church, he is the head of state. And uh, even though uh, Assyria does not have a land today, she is a nation and he is mm -hmm. the head of state. And that's a whole different uh, responsibility altogether. He's got to weigh every word. He, he's got to be very measured in everything he thinks and does. And, um, and I gave word to Father Bet Rasho, please explain to the patriarch, I get it. I understand yeah. it. And I uh, yeah. want to protect that in every way that I can, uh, because I understand that on a much deeper level. Yeah. And because by the, the way, uh, Go ahead. Uh, and if I could just add this, I have heard periodically criticisms of the patriarch, not him, but the position of patriarch. I think it's easy to criticize someone when they're not saying things you want to hear them say, but we forget as, as a head of state, you cannot just be a blabbermouth saying things. Yeah. You've got yeah. to weigh your words with, with great wisdom. And uh, so we need to pray for him. We really need to pray for him and seek God to give him the wisdom and the words and the grace that he needs because he's in a lot of extreme high pressure situations. Yes. Yes. And I've got a lot of people um, um, writing comments. That's why you see me putting on my glasses. It says, great job. Bless you both. I just want to be able to give you some of the messages. Muna Mirza is saying, Shlama, that's actually my childhood friend. Uh, Shara Giwag is giving us a lot of hearts and there was a message that it says I, I need to get the book so I'm going to be sending this out. This is very interesting. God, great job. God bless you both. Uh, Amina Khinu says my son, he loves it. Thank you so very much. So we've got younger people listening and resonating to your message, Dr. Susek. Um, 
you know, and I have someone here that I wanted to actually, Kevin, Kevin Jones from Buckeye, Arizona is listening. He said, this is the first time here. I hope you enjoy the program, Kevin, and I hope you come back and listen because we've got great message. And this is not just about the Assyrians. This is actually about all of the body of Christ. And, uh, you know, we want to, we want the world to know that uh, we are Assyrian Americans and that we are uh, members of the body of Christ and uh, we are with you and we all stand together. And, you know, sometimes the West has forgotten that Jesus came from the East and uh, when the East is coming to the West, then I know it's almost like uh, we don't recognize each other's culture, each other's language, and even with the faith, you know, and, and it's easy to become judgmental. So I hope that we can break down and this book actually breaks down the walls of separation, the walls of division between the East and the West. And I think it was God's providence and his plan always to have the Christians of the East come to the West so that they can see and they can feel and they can witness and they can hear that here you have a persecuted nation that survived to come to America, uh, which we have always considered a Christian nation. I don't care what anybody says. Yes, every religion uh, is freely uh, exercised and practiced here, but America has always to us, and this is why we resonated and we look to that beacon of hope to America. And this is why most of the, um, and, 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 and a lot of the, the European world uh, countries, but mostly uh, America, Dr. Susak, we've always seen and we've always believed and we will always believe that uh, America, freedom of faith, yes to all faith, but it was built on Christian values. And so we appreciate all the listeners, all the viewers, and uh, we will have Dr. Susak back, like I said, he, we're stuck with him. That's what he said, right? We're stuck with you. I did. And by the way, our my good buddy, my new good buddy, Sam Abraham and Aggie have been watching. And we're looking forward to some great days ahead with them. Yes, absolutely. And uh, with that, I want to leave you, I want to leave the program today with a song that was so beautifully sung by Miss uh, Sumar Lawandu, one of the Assyrian artists. Uh, and Yosef uh, uh, Albert uh, Ruel, uh, who, whose father was a famous uh, singer in Iraq and here. He was actually a legend, one of those legends that beautiful. And his son, uh, the apple hasn't fallen far from the tree, has just as beautiful of a voice. So I want to leave you with the song that was so quickly written by Shamasha Yushia Givargis, who's a deacon in our church, in honor and I'm sorry for the uh, non-Assyrian speaking that you're not understanding the words, but I think you'll be blessed by the music, by the melody, um, uh, and, and the way that it's, it's, it, it was sung. And uh, I want to leave you uh, uh, at the final, uh, at, at exiting the program to say thank you, Dr. Susak, for your time. As always, you always fill in and, and you give us such, so we, we feed on the knowledge that you give us and you're so prepared to give a full explanation of everything that's going on. We want to thank you for all that you're doing. May God bless you and richly uh, and keep you healthy and and uh, always on your feet, always um, being able to work uh, for the purpose of God. And we are here to partner with you and we are here to help you and we are here to be your assistant. Thank you so much for being on the program once again. God bless you. My honor and looking forward to when I'm back in Phoenix. Thank you. We'll look forward to it. And I'll, I'll leave you with the uh, final song of the day. Thank you. Shlama. <laughs>
And he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Write, for these words are true and faithful. The world is not ending. God is preparing a new world soon to begin. An ancient nation thought lost to extinction is soon to rise anew to prepare for that day. Isaiah identified this nation in a prophecy that has been hidden in plain sight for some 2,700 years. Its name is Assyria. My new book, The Assyrian Prophecy, reveals how Assyria will join with Israel and Egypt to bless the world under the soon coming Messiah. Amid today's chaos, God is searching for righteous people through whom he will bring the prophecy to completion. When you reach the end of this book, one question will be in your mind. 
Lord, what would you have me to do?